Hey, Jaron, what's happening, dude? Hey, Bobby. How you doing, bub? It's, it's kind of a weird question to ask what's happening, because I think we all know exactly what's happening with everybody at this point. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a weird time, bro. You know, I find myself, because I'm still doing my radio show every day, that I look forward now to that block where I know that I'm going to be working. Where It wasn't that I didn't look forward to it before, but now it's like I'm look, I look forward to that piece of structure. What are you doing to kind of keep your schedule structured a bit? Man, um... I, mean, I know exactly what you're saying there, too. I feel like it, my, when I'm, we're doing all these writing sessions now, like via Zoom, you know, the, inter, the, the Internet or whatever, and it's like FaceTiming. I'm sure you guys are doing meetings with it and stuff, too. But uh, I look forward to it so much because I'm not just sitting there <laughs> w- wondering what's wrong with the world and if it's going to get fixed. And so I'm basically just being creative and writing and, you know, trying to, trying to write the, the next Cadillac 3 record and write some hits for other people, man. So what's a Zoom writing session like? It's weird, dude. The first, I say the first, like, two were tough. And then you kind of get used to it. And actually, like, I'm really enjoying it now because I've got, I got it down and I've got all the, you know, there's like 15 screens in my little studio room and everything's running at once. So it's kind of like flying a little plane. So it's, it adds a couple extra challenges in that. And songwriters can get stuck in a rut, you know. And so this is kind of cool. It adds a little dynamic to it. First time I've talked to you really since you put the record out. I know I did a little uh, promotional piece for you guys as you were putting it out, and I've listened to the record. But, I mean, congratulations on putting out another full project, man. Thanks, buddy. It's, you know what? I, I don't take that lightly because it's hard for artists to get records out these days. You know, like full records, man. Yeah, so what, what was the difference in maybe doing this record whenever I would assume you have a little more freedom this time to do what you want because you know who you are a little bit more? What was the difference in this record and the last one? Uh, I think the last one we were kind of trying a little too hard, and this one we were a little bit more, like you're saying, you know, like maybe more confident. And, uh, you know, it's just like anything. It's like working out. If you work out, your muscles get bigger. You know, if you're doing this stuff a little longer, your your production skills get better, your songwriting gets better. And I think this one we kind of stuck to a vibe that, you know, kind of was a little bit more cohesive than the other records that we've done. And you produced this record too. Am I right about that? Yeah. So your producing skills, again, I'm just going from memory here. Didn't you produce some of Kelly Bannon stuff, too? Yeah, man, I did Kelly's record. I just did Drake White's new thing and a um, bunch, of, bunch of cool stuff, man. I've been lucky. So what, what's, what is it for you, then? Because you're writing songs for other folks. You're producing records now, obviously the Cadillac 3. Like, where is this going to end up for you in five years, in your mind? I hope, hope down at my beach house, man. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie to you, bro. I'm trying to. I've got as many irons on the fire right now, just so I can get out of here. Wait. So, <laughs> what is it as a producer? Because I think I'll, most folks, and I wouldn't have known until I went to a comedy record. But what is it as a producer? Like, what do you do? Let's let's take you out of Cadillac Three right now and take you out of songwriting. But you're just Jaron, the producer. Let's say Drake White comes up to you. Love Drake. Love his sound. He says, "Hey, man, I want to do this project." Like, what are your roles as a producer whenever that happens? Well, usually, man, it's like when. When somebody calls a producer, or like in the, at least Mike, from what I've gotten from this, they usually like what I do on my my stuff, at least. You know what I mean? Like, the most calls I get, they're usually somebody pairing us up because, um, or, you know, like Drake, he, he likes the way the Cadillac stuff sounds. Or, or, you know, they hear these these crappy demos that I do to pitch to artists for country songs, you know, like for to, to record, and they love the way those things sound, and so I, I guess you kind of just get put in those places. And, you know, I'm a huge Drake White fan, huge Kelly Bannon fan, so it was like getting to getting to do that. I, you know, as soon as somebody calls and says, hey, can you make me sound raw and dirty but still kind of accessible? I'm like, hell yeah, that's what I try to do, you know? So you go into the studio, and you're the guy that basically tells, hey, we need more guitar, more drums. But what, what if we added another xylophone? I'm just making crap up here, but what if we added a xylophone? Like, it's your creative, like, macro vision, right? Well, you try to be. I mean, like, the way I usually do it is we have the artists come in and they sing live in the room with, with me and the engineer. And then we have a guitar player, drum, a drummer, and a bass player. And then I'm also playing guitar in there. And usually I get the meat and the potatoes in the studio. And then I get out of the studio and take it home or to the bus. And I do everything else, all the background vocals, all the programming, all the overdubs. Wow. And it just lives in my head for about three weeks. And that's how I... that's. That way you don't have to, you cut out a lot of the cooks in the kitchen, you know what I mean? Where did this music education come from as far as like early Jaron? 
I'm um, growing up in Nashville, man. I, you know, I was born here, and I think that you know, it's you know, my dad was in it growing up, and just being around it constantly, and then watching things. You know, growing up in Nashville when country music was Garth Brooks and Clint Black, and you know, Faith Hill and all these mega huge. You saw how big a country star could be. You know, Garth was wearing a damn headset, flying around the room, um, and you realize that oh, this is kind of rock and roll. You know what I mean? So I think that I just kind of from you know six seven years old on i was kind of just really intrigued and excited about music and it was it turns out it was the only thing i was really good at so <laughs> wait so what did your dad do in the business he plays uh he's a drummer he, he was the drummer at the grand Ole opry for shoot 25 30 years he still plays there occasionally and uh yeah so i kind of got to go go to the grand Ole opry every weekend that was my kind of my babysitter when i was a kid oh that's cool do you have any Stories about seeing anybody super cool and like now they'd be called old school at the Opry where you had a moment with them? Oh man, I've got there's so many, Bobby. Like, um, Porter, I remember Porter Wagner. I've stumbled into his dressing room. I was probably 11 or 12, and he had this huge bodyguard named Tony, I think was his name. And he's kind of mafia, like Sopranos esque, but he's a you know, a Nashville guy. <laughs> so, um, he was very intimidating, and so Porter came in there and yelled at me and told me to get the get the <laughs> f out of his out of his dressing room. <laughs> and my dad went up to Porter and, and Tony and said, "If you ever talk to my kid like that again, it's your ass." <laughs> wow, Porter Wagner, man. Yeah, that's a great one. Wow, wow, wow. I, I had no idea. That's cool. Uh, I do want to talk about the record here um, and play a few songs from it. I'm going to play a clip of "Cracking Cold Ones with the Boys." Here you go. With the I'm gonna do the generic thing here. I go, hey, just tell me about this song. Like, what do you think about when you you think when you hear this song back? Well, it's it's hilarious because it, you know it's it's just a you know we've never done a beat like that either. The Gary Glitter, we're gonna kick the hell out of you. And so Neil and I had that track, and and the, I don't know if you've looked. You usually do. You're usually pretty good about this, but. There's seven co-writers on that song. So you know, like that, anybody that yelled out a word in the room, you're, you're on the track. Is that how it went? It's, it's our band. It's our whole band and our whole crew on the road. Oh, wow, it so, is. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, if, it, if you look at that and didn't know, you'd be like, wow, this is so stupid. It took seven people to write this moronic song. <laughs> you know, so it's, but I like it. It's, fun, it's a fun to play uh, live and... You know, we wrote that thing just because I want to be in hockey arenas. You know, that's the I wanted to go to a Predators game and hear that song. That does feel like the boom. You know, when you mentioned Gary Glitter, for those that are listening and don't know who that is, um, by the way, not the best dude, but a, a song that... Right. Dun, 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 like, that's Gary Glitter. And so oh, if yeah. people miss that reference. Uh, how about this one? Hard Out Here for a Country Boy? I'll play a little bit of this one. All right, give me that one. Dude, um, wrote it with Jeremy Stover and Neil on the bus. And we were out on the road with Travis Tritt and Charlie Daniels. And so Travis was, I played him some of the record on the bus one night. We were, I mean, we were getting after it. You know, we were drinking pretty good. And it was probably about 3 in the morning. And they're trying to, bus drivers are trying to get everybody off the bus to leave. And he's like, no, play me another, play me another. And that one came on. And the next day in soundcheck, I heard him playing it. And so I said, man, you want to sing on it? He goes, yeah, because on the road, you know how it is. There's nothing but time. So I was like, he's like, well, I, when do you want to do it? I go, what are you doing right now? And he goes, nothing. So he came over to the bus and sang it in the back lounge. And then Jansen called me during that little session. He said, what are you doing? I said, man, I'm recording T right now. You ain't going to believe this for the new Cadillac record. And he goes, well, what's the song? I go, Cracking Cones. Or, uh, sorry, I go, Hard Out Here for a Country Boy. He goes, well, send it to me. I want to sing on it. <laughs> you know, you know, you know how crazy he is. He probably had fifteen Mountain Dews by that <laughs> time in the day. Um, and so he, I sent the track, and he sent it back the next day, and put harmonica on it and everything. I just like it was one of those things that like easily came together, and it was so fun, man. We tried to line that one up to get all you guys up in the studio for that one. We couldn't quite get all the schedules to work, but that was the one. When I first heard the record and heard that one, I called uh, Tom Lord, who's my manager. And I was like, hey, let's get Jaron and, and Jansen and Travis. And I don't think Travis was able to get down. But that's a jam. Like, that's a, that's a good one. Thanks, man. Hey, Bobby, Travis doesn't leave a house for less than a quarter million dollars. You know, <laughs> I've heard stories about people trying to hire Travis, and it's like, wait, how much? Like, you need to tell me before yeah. I even get out. Of it. Yeah, so 
we weren't able to make that happen for promotional uh, Cadillac 3, so, so sorry about that. It's all good, man. Um, you know, I was reading this article about you guys whenever the intro of the album came out, and it was from Rolling Stone. It said, Why the Cadillac 3 are Nashville's most uncompromising band? 15 years together, and without a country radio hit, the trio refused to chase trends on the new album. Now, as complimentary as that is, because for a long time what I was doing, and because I would get on country radio and just be like, hey, I have other influence. Like, I grew up in Arkansas and I love country music, but I listen to 90s hip-hop, I was an alternative guy, and they would say, oh, the bad boy. But eventually, I didn't want to be the, I wanted my style to be so good that everyone else would do it, right? And so yeah. whenever someone writes a headline like this, a little bit are you like, I appreciate that, but we're trying to break through so hard that we want people to follow us. We want to be the style. Does that ever pop in your head? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that's kind of what they were trying to say there, but you know how press can be, and um, that whole that whole interview um, thing, or that whole piece, is us hanging out with a writer who is a super sweet, very talented writer, very cool person, um, throwing axes at that battle axe place in East Nashville. Yeah. And, and literally, like, so you're writing this whole thing about the history of a band, this new record, all this stuff, and spending an hour with them, you know, and doing, playing a redneck sport. I don't think that, you know, when, when those conversations did happen a little bit in that thing, I think, I think I, I, you know, I hear, when I hear something like that at this point in our careers, I'm just happy they didn't say, you know, this record sucked ass, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or like, or, you know, these guys are trying to be something they're not. At least they're saying things in a positive way. Um, I do know what you're saying, though, and I think that, um, the reason the band that we are and what we're kind of morphing into and uh, the more confident we get and the, the bigger that we're getting more successful um, worldwide is I think that's giving us a thing where it is working, whether it's with radio or not, you know, or, or whatever. I think that our mentality is if we keep doing our whole thing, I think radio at some point will, won't really have a choice because it'll be, you know, kind of like look at Eric Church, the way that happened. He got to a point so big, he's selling so many damn tickets that, it didn't like they could not play it because people were calling in and asking for it, and that's when you win. Um, and he did that by following his own vibe the whole time. So, I mean, we're trying to do that at least. I don't know if that answered your question or not, but if I were writing the story, a different story, I would go the band that a lot of other artists and bands have stolen their sound from, but that they just haven't popped with a song on radio. Because right. listen, there's a lot of derivatives of Cadillac 3 out there. And I know you pro we're not going to, I'm not going to say anybody specifically, but I think you probably think this too. Like your style has been taken by a lot of people and they've ran with it and they've done well with it. And that's what right. I think. Do you feel that way? I feel like, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of wannabe clones out there. I think that the way we do it is, you know, obviously a, a different thing, but and it's hard to, to accurately clone. I think the way they're winning is they're, they're they're doing the thing that we kind of refuse to do, and that's that's you know it'd be real easy for me to you know record me while back at Mama's or some shit like that or, or beaching, you know. Um, but it just it doesn't feel real, and that's why you know I'm kind of like Two Face, you know. I I want to have that 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 creative uh, outlet, writing songs for other people, and then I also want to kick ass. And 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 another thing about those clones that you were talking about that are winning. I guarantee most of them can't can't fill out their hometown, you know. So it's like that's that's a lot of, a lot of the difference too. Well, and before a blog picks up with Jaron saying Beach and her meanwhile back at Mama's, he wrote those songs. You wrote those songs. You're not just bashing those songs. What you're saying no, is no. you could have <laughs> taken one of those songs that you wrote for someone else, and because you know what's going to happen, someone will hear this and go, "Up, oh, Jaron's ch trashing Jake Owen and Tim McGraw." No, no, not at all. Jaron wrote those songs, so I just want to put that yeah. out there. I trashed Tim McGraw and Jake to their faces. <laughs> I just got off the phone with Jake. <laughs> uh, some of the songs so, Jaron wrote. Let me, let me read some of these out. I got seven number ones as a songwriter. You got Beach and Jake Owen, American Country Love Song from Jake. Meanwhile, Back at Mama's Tim McGraw, Southern Girl Tim McGraw, Keith Urban, You're Gonna Fly, Raise Them Up, Urban and Church, Billy Currington, Donut. Now, of those songs, Jaron, did you think about taking any of them to Cadillac 3? Um, no. Um, Raise Them Up was one of those when people asked me that I look back on and say, you know, maybe that would have been one that, you know, but I'm a huge, huge Keith Urban fan. You know, he's one of my idols and got to be friends with him now. And it's like, I don't, I know that I'm, well, I don't know, but I don't think that K 
Cadillac could have gotten that to where it was. And it, it, songs are like babies, man. You want them to go out in the world and do great things. And so that's that's the catch-22 with that stuff. I think, um, but the rest of those, no, we didn't even think about them. I see you have a, a coloring book where it's just pictures of sneakers. And I know you're like me, you're a shoe guy, because I, I, sometimes I'll yeah. see you flex and I'll be like, all right, this is because you got to, yeah, listen, you got a little songwriter money because I know how much these shoes cost. You may not put them up there, but I know. Like, I see it. Uh, what, what's the most, uh, I'm not going to, oh, this, this shoe, what's your favorite pair of shoes, recent pair of shoes? Because, um, man, it's tough. I, I kind of stopped. I've stopped recently because of, there's, I can't wear them out anywhere, man. I haven't left my house in a month, you know? <laughs> so it's like, I can't just post them on Instagram. Hey, look what I got. But I really like the, um, I have the original fours, the Jordans. I love those. Those are probably my first, like when I got my first couple checks, you know what I mean? Those are the things. You, you, go, you go, I mean, you might be like this too. I'm sure you are. Like once you make a little bit of money, and I grew up pretty broke as a kid in East Nashville, and, you know, you didn't have these things. And so you go and you buy all the things you want. You buy that N64. You buy that uh, those Jordans. You buy those Air Max 97s. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it's just so fun. And then you realize, wait, these are, these are such this is such a weird thing to buy because you can only wear it's like a car yeah you can only drive one at a time you can only wear one pair at a time so then you just have shoes everywhere and and no more money I I got a a pair I ordered a pair of shoes about a month ago before we started locking in our houses and I got a pair of the uh, the new Air Max uh, Hunter Orange and Camouflage they just came out yeah you know a few weeks yeah. ago and, and I opened them up and I hadn't ordered any shoes since I'd been in quarantine and my girlfriend goes. Oh, that's cool. You got a new pair of shoes. Where are you going to wear them? To the kitchen or the bedroom? Yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah. You might go out on the deck. Give them some, give them some vitamin D there. Uh, so, okay. Everybody should check out Country Fuzz. Um, it's their fourth album. It came out back in February, but um, that doesn't mean the music is, is any worse now that we're here in April. Um, but if, yeah, if, yeah. And if yeah. you're, you're just now hearing us talk about Cat, uh, the Cadillac 3, check them out. I'm a big fan of Jaren as a songwriter, oh, thanks. even Kelly's stuff at, when you were producing it. Like, you know, listening to it, it was just a new, rawer sound for her. I can't wait to hear the Drake stuff. I'm just a fan of you, man. Well, I appreciate it, man. Hey, um, we're dropping something a little special next week, so uh, keep a lookout. It's a, a new single. Uh, and it's not on the record either because we, we were bored here, and so we <laughs> recorded stuff. I recorded it all at my house and then kind of did the rest via Zoom and all that stuff. It's, it's going to be pretty cool, man. You're going to dig it. How do you record via Zoom? Well, I send them the track, and then um, it's, it, you got to link up and all this. I mean, it's, it's, it's recording into iPhones and singing it in real time and then me taking the track. Like, it's, Holy it's crap. a real pain in the ass. <laughs> but it sounds cool, and it sounds different, I think, so all right. than anything that we've done, and that's kind of that's fun, you know. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Hey, man, good luck. Good to talk to you, and I hope everybody, the, to, to the folks that haven't, really invested any time in listening to you guys. I encourage it. And uh, dude, hopefully I'll see you out and about in human life soon. Thanks, Bobby. Stay safe, bud. All right, Jaren. See you, bud. Hey, guys. It's Bobby Bones. Welcome to the channel. If you're new to the channel, subscribe and then go check it out. A lot of artists, a lot of songwriters, a lot of music. Welcome to the Bobby Cash channel.